Coming up, a report by the state of Colorado looks at the tragic history of boarding schools. Plus, we get a look at the new season of PBS's Native America series. We hear from two of the show's producers, Pam Bellegarde and Daniel Golding. We have those interviews plus headlines ahead on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands on the web at iltf.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Hopa. Thank you for joining us. I am Alia Chavez. We start above the medicine line where after 145 years, an indigenous person has been elected to serve as Manitoba's premier, which is a position similar to a state governor in the U.S. How do you do? I'm Wab Kanu. Rapper, journalist, economic student, and now premier, Anishinaabe politician Wab Kanu and the New Democratic Party rode what Canadians are calling the orange wave into office Tuesday night. The party takes office after seven years of progressive conservative governments in the region. Kanu said the, they cut much needed public services and he campaigned on a better government. When Canoe's father was a young man, he was not allowed to vote under Canadian law. But he said Canada is changing, and it's a win for everyone in the province. We are doing exciting things with health care here in Manitoba. We're going to build new emergency rooms. We're going to build a new cancer care headquarters. More clinician researchers to bring the best quality care to you, the people of Manitoba. And so, for all the people out there who work in health care, we need you. Canoe is expected to be sworn in in the coming days and will lead a province with the largest population of Indigenous people, according to the 2021 census. Métis citizen John Norquay was the province's fifth premier until 1887. Staying international, Brazil's Supreme Court is ruling in favor of the protection of indigenous land rights. This is a historic win for the country's indigenous citizens since the kill bill kept advancing despite protests. The bill states that indigenous lands will only be recognized if native people were living there when Brazil's constitution was formed in 1988. Brazil's powerful farm lobby and agriculture committee pushed this bill to expand access for commercial agriculture in indigenous territories. Activists displayed high emotion outside the Supreme Court's headquarters in Brasilia when the majority vote was announced. Sonia Guajajara, Brazil's Minister for Indigenous Peoples, celebrated what she called a great achievement. The indigenous rights group Survival International commemorated the defeat of what they called a devastating assault on indigenous communities and the Amazon. Survival's research and advocacy director Fiona Watson said the bill's rejection was important, not only for indigenous people, but in the global fight against climate change, too. Nine of the court's 11 members voted against the bill. Well, back in the U.S., cities and states are gearing up for Monday's Indigenous Peoples Day. President Joe Biden officially proclaimed the day as such starting in 2021, and all signs indicate that he will do so again this year. That comes as the second Monday of October has historically been celebrated as Columbus Day. The holiday has now been reimagined to include a celebration of the vibrant and diverse people who first inhabited this land. Already, several major cities and states have opted in. In New York, a celebration is being planned on Randall's Island, while a sunrise ceremony is scheduled on the banks of Bede Makuska in Minnesota. In Oklahoma and Chicago, events are planned at local restaurants, and the city of Berkeley in California is planning its powwow and market. 
There are, of course, tons more events happening. You can find a full list on our website. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. PBS's Native America series is returning for its second season. The Native-directed project reveals the beauty and power of today's Indigenous communities. ICT's Paris Wise spoke with two of the producers and directors, Pam Bellegard and Daniel Golding. My name is Pam Bellegard. I'm from the Turtle Mountain Band of Anishinaabe. My name is Daniel Golding. I'm a enrolled member here at, at the Quetzal Nation in, uh, well, it's Winter Haven, California, but it's actually California, Arizona. So we're right on the border of the Colorado River. Yeah, I'm um, one of the series producers and I uh, assisted, I mean, it was a, it was really a team effort to, um, to produce uh, this series, and I'm just one of many <laughs> very talented, hardworking folks that worked on the on the project. I, I'm a, a series producer, so uh, for for the series, um, and oversaw all four episodes as a series producer. But I also uh, was producer director on the Language is Life episode, which is episode four, and then also was. Uh, the co co uh, producer director for the Warrior Spirit. Daniel, can you tell us about each of the episodes and the segments within those? Yeah, so the, there there are four episodes, right? The first episode is uh, what is it? Uh, New Worlds, which is the one that Boots and Pam worked on, uh, produced and directed, and uh, and that one is about uh, you know it's about technology, you know, native innovators like uh, Aaron Yazzie, uh, Henry Redcloud, who's a sustainable bu builder up in um, Lakota country. And then also, you know, uh, Hallucination, we profile Hallucination, uh, who's a, a, a First Nations electronic music group. Um, and then our second episode, Warrior Spirit, uh, which, which is about, um, you know, Native communities and uh, the warrior tradition that's still alive in these communities today, you know, <clears throat> through athletics and, you know, connections to, you know, uh, warriors and this and that. So it's, it's a really great episode, very powerful episode. And then um, uh, the third episode is Women Rule, which uh, explores uh, how women are building our, on deep traditions and to improve their communities and lands and new world and worlds. And then finally, episode four, is language is life, which focuses on you know native languages, uh, reviving languages, and using technology and and things to revive those languages. Pam, how are the stories and subjects chosen for this season? It doesn't matter what community you step onto. There are so many wonderful stories in every community. So we worked as a group, um, and uh, you know. Everybody had ideas for stories. We brought them together as a group. And then we had to whittle down to, you know, a handful and then whittle it down again. And and uh, uh, so it was it it wasn't uh, an easy process uh, because there's so many elements, you know, it has to be exciting and and, uh, you know, there's that element of the story. And then we also have to get the people to agree to open up their homes and their lives and their hearts to the cameras, uh, to the world, really. And um, I know uh, I can speak for the episodes that I worked on, and everybody was so excited to uh, be a part of the part of the project. And uh, because, you know, their stories are important, and uh, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> We were not heard from very often on the big screen. And, uh, and, and so, you know, they were brave souls to, to allow us to do that with them. But yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it was, um, it, could, it could have been challenging sometimes just because a lot of good stories out there. And speaking of that, 
you know, we are going for a season three because there are so many good stories. We are going for a season three. We're, we're pushing for it. That's great. As you mentioned, I mean, this series is very unique and watching it, a lot of the themes definitely resonated with me personally, and I know they will resonate with Indian country as well. How is it being able to craft stories that frame some of our history, but also really what Native people continue to experience today? Yeah, and I think that was the the challenge, right? Because we're, you know, we're talking about contemporary stories and and you know, it seems like a lot of documentaries and stories about Native people really focus on the past sort of trauma, right? And we're trying to go beyond that trauma, right? And so, but you just, you still have to include sort of the backstory to why you're there. But, you know, I think for me, it's it's all about, you know, being, being survivors, right? So, you know, overcoming those challenges and those things that were forced on us and, you know, moving forward through that and that I think that's what kind of inspired me to work on this series but also to really you know I always say this isn't about me you know this series isn't about me it's about all those people's stories that we're telling like Henry Red Cloud or or Donald and Dwayne you know up in Passamaquoddy or you know Bo Carroll from Cherokee or you know it's their stories right this is about them and uh and they're to me, they're the real heroes, right? They're the ones that are out there in the trenches working to do the things that they do to make our worlds better. They're the survivors just as much as what we are. And I think that's that's the power of the series, right? Even though we have these sort of unspoken shared experiences within us, you know, that that where we can talk about them, but we also, you know, have that power, that warrior spirit to kind of move forward and, and really you know, strive, you know, to be, you know, the next leaders. And, and so for me, like, it's inspiring the next generations, right? My son, even yourself as a, as a journalist, and, uh, you know, uh, because you're going to be the next leaders, right? And, um, and so those are the things that are really important about these, but you, and so blending those stories, the past histories with the current, um, uh, where we are today, was really important. And I think we did a really, really good job of that creatively, you know, using animation and things to really paint those pictures and stuff like that. So uh, I, I was totally, you know, blown away of how well these episodes look. And I, I really can't wait for people to see them. And I hope that inspires them as well as we as we continue to move forward. Yeah, we try to bring in young people, get them behind the scenes, because that's really, and make connections, because that's really the way that it happens. I remember, you know, when I started, when I started getting into uh, film, you just got to jump in there, get out of your comfort zone, and meet people, get on sets if you can, you know, whatever it takes, you know, that's really what you have to do, because our field is not like, you know, nursing, or working as a lawyer, or a teacher, where, you can go and apply for a job and there's a lot of job openings. We're all kind of, uh, you know, we all have that warrior spirit to be able to do what we're doing now because we have to really step out of our comfort zone and go make it happen, really. If anybody's interested in this, you know, in filmmaking or radio or television production, whatever it is, you know, we welcome them to contact us because we really want to support them in their in their endeavor, you know, in their vision for themselves. Yeah, I was going to say, I think this is this is a unique time these years coming up. You know, there's been a lot of change happening in media where, you know, Native Native people are being able to, to, to tell their stories more. And uh, so I think it's ripe for more Native producers, creators to be involved and tell these stories. And I think that's the great thing about Native America was having the the producers and, you know, team there uh, to work. You know, it's it's a hard profession to be in. There's not a lot of opportunities, but we need to create more. And I think, you know, that's why we always keep preaching like for a, a season three, you know, because then we can bring in more, uh, you know, Native prof- professionals involved and giving them opportunities as well. 
Native America premieres Tuesdays, October 24th through November 14th. Check your local listings on PBS, pbs.org, and the PBS app, where you can also catch up on the first season. Pam Belgard and Daniel Golding, thank you so much for joining us. Miigwech. Miigwech. For hiding us. Colorado, a report released this week details the difficult and tragic history of the state's nine federal Indian boarding schools. The report was mandated by the legislature, and researchers and officials hope it can serve as a step toward truth and reconciliation. ICT's Stuart Huntington went to the campus of Fort Lewis College, where the movement in Colorado toward addressing the past and working toward healing began years ago. Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado sits in a beautiful valley surrounded by breathtaking mountain scenery. But under the beauty lies some difficult truths. The territory was once home to the Fort Lewis Indian Boarding School, where the state investigation revealed at least 31 Native students died and were buried in unmarked graves. The college also used to be home to plaques at the center of campus that celebrated purported positive effects of Indian boarding schools in language campus leaders call whitewashing. In 2019, things began to change. It really was the urging of students and faculty who came to leadership and, and um, pointed out uh, the harm that that creates. And uh, and leadership listen, and we formed um, what we called the um, Fort Lewis History Committee, and uh, that was made up of uh, various faculty and staff from across campus who began to um, to look at our history more in depth and to make recommendations about how we move forward and begin a process of reconciliation. So on our clock tower at Fort Lewis College, we had panels depicting the boarding school era that said students learned valuable skills. And we had indigenous faculty who a former student, Dr. Jocelyn Lee, who sent me an email saying, I walk by this every day, how can this be on our campus? And she was right to call the question. The school decided to remove the plaques and in 2021 did so with direction from tribal leaders. But more still needed to be done. And then two years ago, uh, we really didn't think that that was far enough. And working with the Ute Mountain Ute and Southern Ute, came together on campus to propose a bill, to, to, to form a bill that would look at uh, trauma and, and potential student deaths that happened at Fort Lewis Indian Boarding School. Uh, you cannot heal, uh, you cannot look forward with clear eyes unless you know what you're looking back at. The bill they pushed became law and directed state historians to investigate boarding school history. The subsequent report details abuses and degradations that occurred at Colorado's nine federal Indian boarding schools that operated between 1880 and 1920. It lists more than 30 student deaths at the Grand Junction Indian Boarding School and archival records on at least 31 students who died at Fort Lewis. The report comes against the backdrop of a similar federal inquiry. In 2022, the Department of the Interior released its findings on the impact of the boarding school era nationally. This is long overdue. Um, as an indigenous person, I fully understand that, um, that confronting these histories is, is long overdue. But I also fully believe that we are in a time where it has never been more important um, to be honest and transparent about our histories and to be responsible and accountable to those histories and how we reconcile that. The Fort Lewis Cemetery sits on a small, unmarked and fenced off plot on a large site that is mostly an agricultural and teaching facility. Ground penetrating images reveal that the site holds 46 graves consistent with those of children. That's more than the 31 student deaths that show up in the archives. Given the complexity of the site, there are more than 400 people buried there. The true number of student deaths may never be known. This report really is kind of a, a final product. 
But even with all the information that we did gather and that we did see, um, we haven't been through everything. Um, and then also in a lot of ways, I think there's still a lot of questions. This was, we tried to make a really thorough report, um, but we did have a condensed timeline. And I think as a researcher, I have more questions. But question marks aren't stopping Fort Lewis. For us, as an institution, the fact that any child died at Fort Lewis Indian Boarding School, even one, is too many. And that we have a responsibility. Uh, and for us, uh, that responsibility is to creating a better educational experience for Indigenous students who are at our institution now. One way they are working on that is turning the land under the old boarding school into a center of healing, connecting ancestral ways with students of today. I think our traditional garden that we have here is a great example of reclamation of this educational space um, from this very painful history and past um, to a space that uh, centers indigenous knowledge uh, and uh, contributes to healthier, thriving Indigenous students and communities. What's next for the student ancestors buried at Fort Lewis? That's for Native leaders to decide. From here, tribes take the lead. The school's Tribal Advisory Council is scheduled to meet again in November and start the discussions. I think for the nation, um, this remains a critical conversation uh, to begin a process of reconciliation and healing uh, for indigenous people and for tribal nations uh, so that the, we provide an opportunity um, for, for our communities to heal um, and more importantly, uh, to thrive. I think for us, at the end of the day, children aren't meant to die at school, period. In Durango, Colorado, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. More than 40% of Fort Lewis College students are Native American, and the school offers tuition-free education to students enrolled in federally recognized tribes or their children. And today's newscast recognizing one of the nation's most prestigious awards, the MacArthur Fellowship. The foundation announced a new class of 20 winners on Wednesday. The MacArthur Fellowship is a $800,000 no strings attached award given to extraordinarily talented and creative individuals. Three indigenous creators were included in this year's announcement. Winners include Raven Chacon, who is Dene. He is a composer whose work cuts across boundaries of visual art and performance to illuminate landscapes, their inhabitants, and histories. Last year, Chacon became the first Native American to win the Pulitzer Prize for music. For me, noise is another timbre, but it's a timbre that contains a lot of information. Noise can be a carrier of history, it can be a carrier of story, and it can tell a lot about the person who's making it. My name is Raven Chacon, and I'm a composer and artist. I make scores and sound installations, and I make noise. The work almost always starts as, as some kind of score. And sometimes these scores are prompts for improvisation. Sometimes they're more prompts for a composed piece of music. Another winner is Diane Whitehawk. She is a Lakota multimedia artist. European and European American histories have created a hierarchy that has lifted up certain art forms, certain people, certain communities, and devalued others. These conversations in my work push back against those hierarchies, ask us to think critically about how we tell our histories, what 
parts of our artistic history on this continent have been excluded. My name is Diani Whitehawk. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Abstraction is a global practice that has been practiced in communities for longer than I think we understand. It's certainly a practice that has been practiced on this continent pre-colonization by my ancestors, distilling complex ideas and thoughts down to the most graceful and poignant gestures. That's a human practice. From Hawaii, Patrick Makuakane is a kumahula and cultural preservationist. He blends traditional hula with contemporary music and movements. In Hawaiian, there's a word called kuleana, which means your responsibility that you bring to the table. Something that's unique and special that you do that uplifts your world, so to speak. Our ancestors were highly innovative people. What I'm doing with Innovating in Hula is keeping that innovative spirit of our ancestors and my kuleana. I am Patrick Makuakane and I am a kumuhula and cultural preservationist. In Hawaiian, kumu means foundation, uh, the trunk of a tree or teacher. So kumuhula would be a hula teacher. world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.